So, um, Numbers chapter 12, verse 28. When you have it, say amen. amen. We're going to read out of the message translation. It says, do you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. If you are a believer today, this entire world has nothing to do with what you're able to amass and collect. It's about God's kingdom and his will being done on earth as it is in heaven. It's unshakable. So right now, if you're feeling shaken, well, you might want to tell your feelings uh, to go south. Because we're not people of feelings, we're people of faith. Listen, and some of you, I know you're like more logical. Some of you are like me. You're like, you're all up in your feels, but that's not what we're called to be. At the end of the day, feelings and logic can, can fail you, overwhelm you, but it's faith that leads you and guides you in Jesus' name. And do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming with worship. Deeply reverent before God. It's a holy fear before God. For God is not an indifferent bystander. He's actively cleaning house. And you're seeing that like never before in the last many, many years, especially in churches and in pulpits. God is merciful, he's kind, but I'm gonna tell you like never before, and I don't know what your eschatology is on the end times. You know, I believe in pre-trib, some of you don't, that's okay. Either way, we're gonna to go to heaven. So let's just celebrate that and quit arguing over things that honestly are robbing us from telling our neighbors about Jesus. Amen. So he's cleaning, he, he's cleaning house, torching all that needs to burn. And he won't quit until it's all cleansed. God himself is fire. Somebody say, let him cook. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your help. We can count on you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to talk to you today about a subject that says you can count on God. Look at your neighbors and say you can count on God. <laughs> Some of you have quit counting on God and you've started counting all the times he, that God has forsaken him, which is completely a violation of scripture because God doesn't forsake, God doesn't leave, God doesn't violate his word. He's a man, he's a God that does not lie, he loves you. But speaking of counting, We've got to go to a book that maybe a lot of us don't spend a lot of time in. It's the book of Numbers. If Numbers in our life weren't important, there wouldn't be a book called Numbers. And so we're going to go to Numbers 13 here in a little bit, but I want to set up the text. And I believe this is going to encourage some of you right now with where you're at because some of you are on the brink of giving up. Some of you are considering and pondering things you never thought you'd consider and ponder as far as your faith goes, your family, your marriage, your job. And God is going to tell you and you're going to see in the scripture, hold on because God's still at work though you don't feel him or even see him. You have to know that he's at work. So, um, so we're going to set up this text in Numbers 13. The children of Israel have come out of slavery and are in the wilderness. And, and they're, they're right on the cuffs. I mean, they're, they're right on the edge right here of the promised land. Uh, and, and Moses says, let's do our due diligence. I'm going to send um, a spy mission to go check out the land that's actually already ours. So God says it's ours. And, and he's like, well, I'm going to just do due diligence. God, God said, pretty much just go get it. And I'm so thankful that God in his mercy is patient with us sheep. Because he says it's ours, we're like, well, we're just going to double check and do a few things. And, and there's nothing wrong with planning and, and, having, and having a game plan. And so we're going to jump right into the middle um, um, of their secret mission here in Numbers 13, verse 23. We're going to read about 10 verses. So take your Adderall, take a deep breath, here we go. When they reached the valley of Eshcol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and, and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh and, and the desert of Paran. And there they reported to them and to the whole assembly and we, they showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went to the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful. I mean, they're scary. And uh, the cities are fortified and they're very large. 
We even saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites um, live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can do it. You always see someone who says, we can do it, we can win. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land. Be careful with people in your camp that like to talk negatively. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak and, um, um, uh, come from the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we looked the same to them. Some of you like history. You're really, really good. Like my, my wife, when she reads stuff from a historical standpoint, whether it's biblical or you know, geographical or just you know, or literal, she can, she can just, she just, just tell you things. I mean, and honestly, I, I've even admitted to her a little bit. I'm like, it makes me a little jealous because I've got a phenomenal memory with certain things, especially numbers. Like, I love math. I mean, you, you, want, you want to get into a math contest? Let's go. I, I love it. And, 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 of course, she's awesome with that as well because she's pretty much good at everything. But history, I mean, she, I mean, she'll, she'll look up something. You know what? That happened back in 1842. What? 1842, oh, absolutely. You know, so-and-so um, um, was king of, 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 of this area during this time. Are you serious? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, when did you read that? Oh, I saw it the other day on a documentary. The other day? Yeah, about 10 years ago. 10 years ago. <laughs> and she'll just tell you stuff. She, she loves history. Uh, some of you are, like my daughter, my youngest, phenomenal with English. I mean, you love English. You know, just the way things are done, situated, you're a phenomenal writer. But there's a lot of people who hate one thing. They hate the subject of math. You know, if you're from Oklahoma, we all know that two plus two is seven, and we do our best. But some of you are like, you know, if getting to heaven is contingent upon my, math, my mathematical abilities, I'm probably not gonna make it. A lot of people like history, of course we all love PE, but you hate math. And it's interesting that this book has this title, Numbers. Um, I get Genesis, the book of beginnings. I get Exodus. Um, that's the book of you know, Exodus or departures. But why in the world would a sovereign God choose to name a book Numbers? Maybe it's because attached to a number is generally a name. And attached to a name is, is a person. And maybe God has us count people because people count to God. He doesn't work. I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't have you count people for your ego. But you'll, he'll have you count people because the numbers are attached to a name and the name is t- attached to a real person. And sometimes God will have you count people because people count to God. And this is how the book of Numbers starts. It starts with Moses taking a census of the children of Israel. And again, if you've done your research and you've read this. Now, before I even get to the book of Numbers and, and why even Moses would take a census, let's understand the history of these people. Some of you know where I'm going. And for those of you that maybe you're new to the Bible or back to the Bible, I want to just let you know what's going on. For 400 years, they've been in slavery. For four centuries, they have been in bondage. For 400 years, they have been demeaned. For 400 years, they've been in bondage. For 400 years, they've been demoralized. And some of you are upset about your 24-day trial. Like, I don't know where God has been. I've given him a month, and it's it's day 24. Um, Read the book of Numbers, you'll feel instantly better about what you're going through. (laughs) And let me just tell you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a group of people who have been through generational trauma. And some of you have been through trauma. Some of you have had generational trauma passed down to you, which is why we believe in deliverance and why, thank God for coming to church and thank God for quoting his word and declaring his word. But you know, I will tell you, everyone that I know of needs to be delivered from something. Just be around someone and let them talk and let them act for five minutes. She's like, oh, you're bound. Oh, no, you're you're bound. You need Jesus. Go to celebrate recovery. (laughs) For 400 years, they've been in slavery calling out to God to deliver them. A God they knew was a deliverer in their mind, but they had never experienced deliverance in their actuality. And so as they cried out to God, and, and, and they, thought, they think all hope is lost, here comes God, faithful, raising up a deliverer named Moses. And Moses sets them free. Moses' knees are knocking. He's got that little stutter going on. And he walks up, and he walks up to Pharaoh and says, 
quit, quit playing. Let my people go. Don't think God can't use you. You talk real well. God, look at Moses. Pastoring three million people, my goodness. And so in one night, I, I love how God works. And this, is, this should encourage some of you because some of you have been crying and you're upset. And I'm sorry that you've been enduring what you've been enduring. And some of you have experienced some crazy tragedy. But you never know when God's going to do what God already said he's done. And in one night, water splits and they walk out of servitude into sonship. They walk out of slavery into freedom. They're from singing songs of depression to shouting for joy. And in one night, after four centuries, they experience crazy freedom. But hold on though. The math ain't mathin'. They're, they're, no, no, they're no longer in bondage. Because you would think if you were stuck in something for 400 years, it would take you like 400 years to get out of that thing. I would think for as long as you were stuck in slavery, it would take that long for you and I to get out. But when you're counting on God, it doesn't matter how long you've been in it. After 400 years, in one night, they get to victory. After 400 years, one moment, they walk up out of it. That's why you keep believing, you keep declaring, you don't quit going to church, you keep giving, you keep loving your spouse, you keep loving your kids, you keep leaning into God. Yes, you're going to make mistakes, you repent, rinse, repeat. And I asked God, I said, God, show this church, show, show us some way that you are faithful and you're greater than anything we're going through. And I don't know who this message is for today, but listen, uh, some of you are looking at me like you can't shout. But listen, I know a God and you know a God. Some of us have forgot how good he is, but God has done so much for us. If he does nothing else, you've got reason enough to thank him and say you're faithful and you're good. I don't care how long you've been stuck in something. When God wants to get you out, he will get you out. When God wants to set you free, he'll set you free. And I know, I know, I know somebody here can testify to the fact that you've been stuck in something for years, but all of a sudden you had a cataclysmic encounter with the divine power of God who still delivers, and in one moment, God got you out. Can, I, I, that, that, that God is so faithful. In fact, it'd probably be a good time to, just to take a few moments and just thank God a little extra because he's faithful. Thank God a little extra that you're, that you're still alive. Thank God a little extra that no matter what has happened, God is still working on your behalf. God loves you. You're the daughter of the king. You're the son of the king. And he's delivered you out of things more than you realize. And if you can't shout, just find if you're like, well, he hadn't bought me out of nothing. Well, just sit there and be quiet. That's okay. But God has done so much for us. He's, he's pulled us out of addiction. He's pulled us out of loneliness. He pulled, he's pulled us out of despair and despondency and bankruptcy. And yet here you are when people say there's no way you'll matter. You've got the yearbook that says it's true. But God has a different book. So if you look at this, the math doesn't make sense. Victory in one night after 400 years. And can you, I don't know if you can see him walking around. I mean, they're just, they're just kind of walking around like the Jeffersons. I mean, I mean they got a little, bit, a little bit of an attitude. I mean, they're, they're sons now. They're no longer slaves. I mean, they got an attitude about them. I mean, God has freed them. God's helped them. God has at work in their life. And he sets them free and he got them out. And he was kind enough to drown their enemies in the water behind them and let them walk through on dry ground so they didn't track any of their past and their future. This is amazing. The only issue is setting them free physically was not the challenge. Setting them free psychologically, or physically took a moment. Setting them free psychologically and emotionally, that was a process. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. God has already declared you free. You've experienced freedom, and yet you're still battling with things from your childhood. You're still battling with things from recent years, and it's overwhelming. You're upset. You're bothered. And you're doing the best you know how. And I want you to know God's still alive and well and by your side. It's, isn't it crazy how physically they're free? And you look at them on the outside and they're like, uh-uh, um, there's no change on you. They're walking free. But if you look at their psyche and, you know, and how they think, how they process their emotions, you're like, uh, uh, you're still stuck in Egypt. And it blows my mind how externally you can look free, but internally you still have areas of bondage. It actually reminds me of, um, not when I went to the promised land, but the Disneyland. Uh, uh, years ago, my wife and I took, um, took our kids and you know, you know uh, uh, Hannah's the oldest, and she was the you know, you know, oldest, but you know, she was still young at the time and didn't really like little hills. Well, like any parent, like the, the hills aren't that bad. I mean, I mean, I mean come on. I mean, you know, so we, I think a, a baby wasn't like a log ride. What was it? What is it? Pir oh, 
It's even worse. So, you know, you know the log, right, if you've ever been in this, you know, you know, it goes down. This, this is Pirates of the Caribbean. I mean, it's a, it's a rapture drop. I mean, you can't feel nothing. You can't feel nothing. And we, and no, 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 she's, no, I, I don't know, Mom and Dad. And, and Gene's like, it's fine. Grace, I mean, Hannah, it's going to be okay. There's nothing to worry about. There's not a big drop. Everything's fine. Okay, okay. And she grabs her hand, and she's nervous the entire time. We're trying, oh, like, like that. We're trying to, we're trying to say, oh yeah. And we get to the very end. I mean, little, little, it's not even a drop. It's, it's really just kind of an exchange. I mean, there, there, there's, there, there's nothing. And that little deal, and she'll still tell you about it to this day. Woo! <laughs> All right. She's freaking out. She's bothered. You lied to me. You lied to me. No, no, honey. No, 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 no. I'll, I'll never do it again. Oh my gosh. In our vows, we need, we need help. We're celebrating recovery. Oh, we, she, she's just, she's bothered. She's upset. You know, and, and we just got three kids. Um, he's got three million people. You talk about, I want to go home. Take me out of Disney. I'm like, spend all this money. I want to go home. And if I, I, I'm just going to tell you, tell, tell you if you've never taken your kids to Disney, Know this, you're going to pay all the money. You're going to pay $100 for a hot dog. You're going to pay $50 for, for bottles of water that should be free. You're going to pay all this kind of money. And you know what? You're going to take them. It doesn't matter about Mickey. It doesn't matter about Minnie. It doesn't matter about anything you've ever read online. You know what they're going to want to do when they go to Disney World or Disneyland? They're going to want to go to the pool. I got a pool. 30 yards. What's this Disneyland? That's where I want to go. Anyway. Usa. Jesus in heaven. Well, I need to be free right now. I mean, we're going to have to do deliverance. Okay. Mm. So, they're like, why did you bring us out here to die? Take us back to Egypt. Take us back. Take me back to Kansas. I don't like this place. And they start complaining in Numbers 13. They, can't, they complain so much that kind, merciful, patient God gets irritated. He gets agitated. He just sends fire and, and just consumes some in the camp. And Moses is crying out to God. And, and, and this is where they are as a people. Moses is trying to get people free emotionally and psychologically, even though they're free physically. And God tells them, okay, here's what I need you to do. I want you to count the people. Why? Because people count. Can you imagine trying to count three million people? You have a tough time just locating your two, your three, your four. We have a tough time, I don't know about your family, we have a tough time just locating our USB ports for our phone and, and our remote controller. I, I don't know how the stuff it disappears. It was right there. And you want me to count three million people? Moses did it in 20 days. How? Because I mean, I, mean, I, I, I want to learn, I mean, like, how, this guy obviously is good with systems. He separates them in a system of tribes 12 tribes of Israel, and he has a tribe leaders report how many are in each tribe. This is all in the book of Numbers. It tells you how many people are in each tribe, and, and this, this is fascinating. God, because God is so strategic, not just to get the exact number and every name of the person, but he actually has a place he wants them to be and a, and a line and an angle that he wants them to be at. Can you imagine three million people all specifically assigned to an exact spot? If I'm in the camp, I'm like, why does this matter? You know what I mean? You want, you want just put me in a tribe. Let's just kind of congregate. Yo, I'll play clash. You figured every, everything out, and we'll be okay. Stop, stop, Bob. I don't need to be in this line this way. My, toy, my toes pointed east. But there was a specific way that God wanted these, um, um, all, all these people lined up. And I don't know if you've ever um, seen an aerial view of what the camp of the Israelites looked like. Do we have that picture? That's an aerial view of what the camp looked like. Now, does that shape look familiar to you? On the ground level, it doesn't make sense for me to be lined up right, right here. But from the aerial view, it is a picture of what is to come. A cross that is coming. The ultimate sacrifice for my sins is coming. And you don't even, listen, and you don't even know while you're specifically lined up and you're placed in a spot in, in, in currently in life and you're bothered, you're upset. Listen, there are some things in your life right now in the valley that you're going through. It makes no sense from your vantage point. But God says, give me some time from my vantage point. You're at the right place. You're at the right time. You're with the right people. You're at the right church. You're with the right spouse. You're at the right job. And quit being upset and quit being bothered by what you see because you don't have my view. Yeah. 
And some of you are bothered by people that walked away. Thank God they walked away. That was all part of God's plan. And the aerial shot, listen, was the cross. I can't tell you how many times in my life in the valley, things made no sense on the ground level view until later God flipped the perspective and said, look, the whole time I had a purpose, I had a plan, I was never confused. You might have been, but I wasn't. And so here they are, they're going through the wilderness. And in our text today, they finally get to the edge. They finally get to the place where the promised land is close enough to smell. And you can see it, and it, look, it, look, it looks incredible. It's amazing. It's brilliant leadership on behalf of Moses. Moses says, I want 12 spies, one from each tribe. And it's the land that we're going to inhabit. But before we inhabit the land, let's just get some info. There's nothing wrong with collecting info. Yes, it's the promised land, but just because it's the promised land doesn't mean we can't have a plan. That's good for somebody to know today because, listen, there comes a time to play, pray, and there comes a time to plan. And just because it's ours doesn't mean that we can't do our due diligence and go explore. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm curious, I don't know, is there a promise that maybe God has given you, but you haven't even taken the time to scout it out? How? Just because it's a promised land doesn't mean you can't plan. God has given you a promise. And I'm not even going to talk about what you're going to have to fight when you actually get there. But one of the first steps to me that even shows you believe the promise is you have to scout out the plan, you know, the promised land that God's given you. God's promised me a husband and a wife. Okay, scout it out. But don't do it in the club. Well, that's why I'm at church. Okay, well, give, give us some time then. We're doing our best. God has given you a promise that might require you going back to school. God's given me a promise. I want to be a homeowner. Scout it out. Have you got a real estate agent? Are you, are, are, you, are you working on your credit score? You can sit there and pray all you want, but there are things you have to do on this earth, on the horizontal level. Because vertically, God's already done it. I mean, it's already finished. And so one of the ways you show you believe God, I want listen to me, is to scout it out. You can have a promise that requires scouting out. You listen, you have to, and you've got to be careful to do this. The promise required that I, that, that, that I leave the comfort of my home, go past the little thing and all that. And, and this is what God is wanting us to do. God is asking you, to, have you scouted out what he's placed in front of you? And you need to understand God's reconnaissance mission. He gives a couple of instructions. He says, go look and see if the people are strong or weak. And he's doing his due diligence. Go look and see if the walls are fortified or if they're, really, or if they're unwalled. He says, uh, go look at the soil. See if it's fertile, if it's plain. It says, go check that out. He gives them all these instructions, but the best instruction was the last instruction. The last thing he tells them, he says, oh, oh and uh, if you can, try to bring some fruit from the land back. This last instruction was the best instruction. Moses says, just bring some fruit from the land back. He, Moses is like, I want a souvenir. And as you're scouting out this land, bring me back some fruit. And the Bible just so happens to mention that this was the season for grapes. Why does Moses want them to bring back some fruit? Because he had been hearing that this is a land full of milk and honey. Why not tell them to bring back some milk and honey? Some of you have been in church all your life, you, you realize that's a metaphor, right? There, there was no milk and honey. You've been in church all your life, you're like, what? No, there was, there was none. It's a metaphor. It really wasn't really flowing with milk and honey. Flowing with milk and honey is a metaphor for abundance. It's a metaphor that the land is fertile. And Moses goes, if you can, bring me some, back some evidence of the abundance. And it just so happened to be the season for what? Grapes. Oh, yeah. Man, look at these suckers. <laughs> They're fermented. Some of you are like, oh, my God, I came to church. Oh, okay, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. And so, and so um, real quick, I'm going to make sure I get you out before game time so we have about three more hours. No, I'm, I'm kidding. If you're, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. Well, maybe. No, anyway. So I, I, I've got three little points, and, and they all start with letter G. So the one thing I want you to know is the, uh, the first point I want to give you is grapes. Grapes. I mean, God is just so good. I mean, they, I can't eat a lot. I've got to stay in ketosis. But they're, they're good grapes. Hmm. Thank you, God. He, he gives you grapes. What are grapes? And I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this from the standpoint of the story. But this is gonna make a lot of sense for where many of you are at right now in life. Grapes are the evidence of the abundance. 
Grapes is the grace of God that has given you confirmation that everything you've been hoping and everything you've been believing for in the Lamb, it is really that good. Grapes are when God gives you a preview of the promise. And here's what I love about God. I hope you're tracking with me. He doesn't have to give you a preview. He wants you to trust him. Yes. He wants you to believe that what he says, that when he says the land is yours, that this is what I promise you, he just wants you to believe him. It's already done. But look at the goodness of God. God says, I'm so good, I'm going to give you evidence of the abundance. Anytime God gives you the grapes, the grapes are a glimpse and a preview of a coming attraction. Now, I don't know if there's anybody that here can testify that sometimes, listen, God will, will do the kind of favor of giving you grapes. But I don't know if you read the passage as well. Again, these grapes were so big. Two people had to carry the cluster. I don't even know if I can find a cluster in this thing. Come on now. I mean, really? Really? We're, we're, we're going to make it. Come on, babe. Two people to carry the clusters. Two. I mean, your, your two-year-old could carry this. You want to talk about some heavy abundance. And you're complaining about the process that God is using right now to get you to a place where you won't have enough hands to carry the abundance he's getting ready to bring into your life. And here's what I love about this. Check this out. When Moses gave them the commandment to go spot the land, he actually told them to stay on the hilltop. He said, you, so here, we're going to honor. We're, we're going to follow instruction. He says, stay on the hilltop. And when you read it, listen, you, read about it, you can read about this when you go to the crib later on. That, listen, this means, uh, it's proof positive that they disobeyed. They disobeyed Moses. He said, stay on the hilltop. Go observe and stay on the hilltop. And they obviously disobeyed. They didn't stay on the hilltop. Well, man, how do you know? I mean, that seems a little far-fetched. Because they got grapes. Because grapes don't grow on the hilltop. This is about to get good. Grapes are in the valley. Come on. That meant, listen, that means they tried to obey Moses, but they didn't. They didn't stay on the hilltop. They went to the valley where the grapes were up. I'm trying to tell you that the fruit that will come out of your life will never be in mountaintop moments. Some of you are bothered that life isn't easier, that life isn't better. That I don't know why my, my spouse and I, we've been arguing. My kids and I, we're just at odds ends. I don't know why my job has just been so uptight because there's no fruit in the mountaintops. It only comes in the valley. So if you want an easy life, you want to go to the mountaintop, but there's going to be no fruit there. Come on. But when God brings you down in a valley, when you go through some stuff, and, 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 and I, I, don't, I don't know how many of you like fruit, I don't know how many of you like abundance, but it's going to take valleys to get you fruit. It's, listen, it's not in the mountaintop moments that the fruit comes. It's in the valley where the fruit is. And some of you need to remember that. Some of you are so upset, you're bothered, and you're shaking your fists at God. And I'm so sorry you're going through what you're going through. But some of you need to say, what? I'm done shaking my fists. I'm going to open my hands and say, thank you for what you're leading me into. Thank you that you're greater than anything I'm going through. Thank you that in spite of what the doctor said, you're faithful. Thank you that in spite of what's happened last year, you're going to bring me through. Thank you that you are at work. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to use my prayer time time to condescend and demean. I'm going to use my time to thank, declare, and decree because I'm the redeemed of the Lord. And the Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say it so. Amen. Amen. And can I just tell you, stop being jealous of other people's fruit when you don't want to go through their valley. Yeah, my, yeah, yeah, my grapes are big, but do you know what I went through for these grapes? You don't know the level of suffering that I've gone through for these grapes. You don't, don't go through the level of trial and torment, and things that I've gone through for these grapes. Yes, I've done things wrong, and yes, I've made my mistakes, and God is patient and, so, and, and is so kind. You're jealous of my grapes, but you don't want my valley. And it, the fact that it took two people to carry a cluster of grapes. I mean, I can't even imagine grapes that big. That it takes two people. I don't need anybody to carry this or or an entire box. I got it myself, but two just two people to carry a cluster. And what's interesting about the book of Numbers is also in the book of Numbers we get instruction about how they transport holy things. You better I hope you better hold on. 
coincidentally, they, they carry the Ark of the Covenant that represented the presence of God also on a pole. Just like they carried the grapes, the clusters on a pole. Why did they carry the Ark of the Covenant on a pole? Because the Ark of the Covenant was the same thing the grapes were. It was a preview of what was to come. Are you getting this? There, there, there was coming an abiding presence of God that would not be in a golden ark. There was going to be a residing presence of God that when God was going to come down in human flesh and tabernacle. And then they were carrying the grapes. God and his grace will always give you a preview. That's why sometimes I like getting to the, the, to the movies early. You, you get to see a preview. Now, the thing that's aggravating is when you see a good preview, you're like, oh, that's incredible. I can't wait for that to come out. Fall of 2032. What? Oh, man, come on. Come on, folks. What's, you got nothing to do but make movies. Uh, okay. You're, and even, but, but even if it's a long time, even, even if that preview is far off, the fact that you show me the preview is proof positive it's already been filmed. That's why, listen, that's why you, you ought to shout when God gives you a preview. I don't care when the release date is. You ought to shout when God gives you grapes. Because once they get grapes after being gone 40 days, they come back to give the report of the mission. And here's where the issue happens. This is where it gets confusing. Because there's 12 spies. And when you hear the report, it starts off like it should. Yo, look at the fruit. Massive. Two people. Crazy. Put it on YouTube. I mean, I mean they're talking about the fruit. They're talking about the abundance. They're talking about, the, you know, man, 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 this place does full with milk and honey. Look at the fruit. And then the next statement should have been, let's just go get it. Says somebody else. And they spoke up. But no, no, no. Hold. There's big people there. But, but the great, no, but there's big people there. There's Amalekites and Amorites and Jebusites and Hittites and Kryptonites and Termites. There's a lot of lights. <laughs> and who's talking? And somebody said, look, there's grapes. And some, some other folks said, uh, there's giants. Somebody says, look, there's opportunity. And somebody says, oh, there's obstacles. Somebody says, look, there's fruit. And somebody says, oh, no, there's going to be a fight. How can people see the same thing and have a different perspective? How can people be in the same service and say, man, God was overwhelming. God was close. God was near. Oh, I didn't hear nothing. I, uh, I'm ready for brunch. I, I got to get home. I got DraftKings um, rosters to figure out. How? How can 12 people see the same thing but have completely different reports? Because later we'll find out that 10 people were focused on the giants and only two focused on the grapes. And it tells us which two believed. What it doesn't tell us is which two were carrying the grapes. But I got the strange suspicion that Joshua and Caleb, yo, bro, you with me? I'm with you, see. Let's, let's go. We, we got this. Because they believed in something. And because you know what? they felt the weight of the fruit. And until you feel the weight of what's coming, you'll never appreciate what happens when you get there. So they're walking through the valley thinking about the giants. I think Joshua and Caleb were walking through the valley thinking about the fruit. That's, that's why I came to tell somebody, when you're in the valley, watch your focus. Make sure you're focused. Come on, you need to hear me. Watch your focus. Make sure you're focused on what God said you can have. And make sure you got somebody who's got some faith in your life. Somebody that says, when you, when you say hallelujah, they say hallelujah. When you say praise, they say the Lord. When you say I can do, they say all things. That's the kind of people you need in your team. I don't need you reminding me of all the things that I've done wrong. I know that. I can tell you daytime and cite it. I need you telling me when I'm on my worst day, God's faithful. The grapes are big. Things are happening. God's on the move. That's the people that you want in your camp. So what are you focusing on? You focus on grapes? Or you focus on the second G, the giants? Ten people, the majority. Sad, I mean, I'm not going to look at the grapes, I'm going to look at the giants in the land. And I want to ask you, are you more focused on the grapes in your life or are you more focused on the giants? The giants represent that voice in your head when God tells you a promise that voice that gives you all the reasons in a PowerPoint presentation as to why it can't happen, that's the voice of fear. And that's what the giants are. It's the voice of fear. And, 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 and so now I'm gonna, I'm, we're gonna, we're gonna go, I'm gonna go where a lot of preachers don't go and some preachers will just tell you, listen, you shouldn't be afraid. Faith over fear. Oh, okay, okay. Just calm down, I appreciate what you have to say. I'm, I'm big on faith too. Uh, but let, let's be real, th th there's giants. I'm, there's giants. There's a bad diagnosis. It's a bad report. The principal called you again. It, it happened. It's, it's there. And, and please don't miss this. 
They weren't wrong for reporting that there were giants. That's facts. The giants are there. Man, and they weren't even wrong for being afraid in that moment. It's the conclusion that they drew from their fear. They drew the conclusion that because they're giants and because I'm afraid, I can't go in. Those were the facts. See, there, there are some people that, 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 that believe that faith is going, is going into the land and saying there's no giants. I grew up you know, a, a little bit around that, saw some people in college that were like, listen, listen you're sneezing. I'm not sick. Go home, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we're believing God. God's faithful. You're healed in Jesus' name, but you're sneezing. Go home. Don't be stupid. Yeah. I'm not sick. There's mucus all down your front. Uh, what happened? I was in a car accident the other day, but I'm fine. What's going on? I'm doing, I'm doing just fine. Dude, you, you, your legs are, I'm, I'm okay. God, God's, already, God's already healed me. Oh, he has? Okay, well, here, um, well, tell somebody else because it doesn't look like that right now. We're believing that's happening. It's in the process, but I mean, don't deny the facts. There were giants. There were struggles. They were afraid. But what are you going to do? That's where faith rises above in spite of, I believe. So listen, faith is not some blind euphoria that like, oh, it's not real. It's not happening. I don't believe it. No, the giants are there. It's real. You know, um, and there's a situation going on in your home. That's what's happening. Your kids are struggling. That's real. They're being bullied. That's real. Your, your, your child, your spouse, your loved one has an addiction. That's real. Now, that's not what we're going to settle for. But we're going to believe for a bigger and better. We're going to believe that the grapes are there. They're coming in our life. The abundance, the breakthrough, the deliverance is happening in Jesus' name. The problem is when you track with me, the problem is when you conclude, I can't go in. That was not a part of the mission. I can't be healed. I can't believe. God's not going to do. No, no. That's where fear has robbed you of the faith you need to be operating in right now. Because God already told you that the land is yours. So are you more focused on the grapes or the giants? They were so preoccupied with the giants, their fear so seasoned that they moved into one thing that God can't work with, unbelief. Caleb, Caleb even tried to speak up. He said, yo, 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 hey, hey, hold on. Uh, uh, because this whole thing started spreading. And just like faith can spread, fear can spread. And everybody just starts murmuring. And, you know, just, just, you know, the churches are really good at it. Thank goodness not this church in Jesus' name. Come on. Caleb's like, no, 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 listen, wait a minute, the fruit. And they're like, no, 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 the, the, you know, the giants. And watch this, an entire generation did not enter the land, not because it wasn't theirs, not because of the giants, and, and not even because they were afraid, because they allowed fear to make them draw the conclusion that they can't go in. So they had unbelief, and God can work with everything but unbelief. Can you prove that in the Bible? I sure can. I appreciate your, your, your encouragement. Thank you so much. In the New Testament, Jesus only ever marvels at two things. And anytime I read anything that marvels Jesus, I'm going to be marveled at as well. Jesus, it says, marveled at people who had great faith, and he marveled at people who had unbelief. I, and I came to tell somebody that's facing a giant in the midst of the promise, don't let the fear drive you to unbelief. God told me to tell you, have faith to believe that what he said is yours. It's yours. Listen, God can put that back together. God is on the way. God is working all things out for your good. God is in control in spite of what you feel, in spite of what the facts, and facts say. God's word is truth, and that's what we're holding on to. He told Abraham, he told Moses, he, he let them know all these ites are going to be in the land. Nowhere in scripture do you see the promise of an unoccupied territory. He told them they were going to be there. You're going to have problems. John 16, you're going to have crap in this life. Stop being so upset about the things I said you're going to go through. All of a sudden, it's like, it's like you're the strongest, courageous, crazy, naive individual. And all of a sudden you get saved. It's like, it's like, it's like you lose your backbone. What? Well, I'm just so scared. To me. You've got Jesus Christ, the living God, the Son, the Lamb of God, coursing through your veins, and you're afraid of cancer? You're afraid of a runny nose? You're afraid of your kids' attention deficit disorder? You're afraid of your spouse not showing up at midnight until midnight? You know, God is bigger than all of these scenes you're going through. Quit allowing yourself to be overwhelmed by the things you said you're going to experience, but you don't have to allow them to overwhelm you in this world. In other words, the presence of the enemies is not proof that there's no promise. The presence of the enemies is proof that the promise is coming to pass. So the grapes are a preview of the promise. The giants is the fear that wants to push me to unbelief. And then number three, grasshoppers. Grasshoppers. What's that thing they said before they were ready to stone Moses and Aaron and, Joseph and or Joshua and Caleb? They said, let's go back to Egypt. 
What's the last thing they said in Numbers? They said, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we look the same to them. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. So we were to them. And a lot of people will preach this text and they'll preach the reality that if you see yourself small and other people will see you small and they'll preach stuff like having a grasshopper mentality. And I'm not coming down on that. And, and I get that vantage point. But I wonder if uh, we're actually seeing two different views. But later, when they actually do get ready to go into the land, remember, Joshua sends two spies to check it out. He's like, uh, I love Joshua. He's like, uh, we tried trouble before. That didn't work too well. We're just doing two. And I ain't making this mistake again. Only two. And remember, they talked to Sister Girl. That, that was the lady of the evening. You remember Rahab? You know, you know, you know, you know, sister Girl, you know who she was. And Sister Girl says, uh, uh, hey, I'm just trying to let you know, they're scared of y'all. And everyone has been, been saying, we're scared of them. And she's like, uh, they're scared of y'all. It's been rumored what your God can do. You have no idea about what the people you're afraid of at work, what they really believe about the God you say you serve, but you've just kind of um, grown lax on lately. They're scared, they're bothered, but if you actually start showing up and being the son and daughter of the king that you really are, things might change in your cubicle. Things might change in your region. Things might change in your family. Yeah. Amen. And, and, and so they, they, they see them as mighty. And, and do you know what the name of the valley is where, that they were in, where they, where they cut off all, all these big oversized grapes? It's called the Valley of Eshcol. Eshcol does not translate to mean big grapes. It actually translates to mean Valley of Cluster. Because the beautiful thing about grapes is they come in a cluster. So, so you, you, you can look at a grape one of two ways. You, you can look at a grape like this. Oh, that's, that's precious. Oh, all right. I'm not, not, not going to do much. You're kind of small. You're kind, you're kind of like the size of a grasshopper. Or you can look at yourself connected to a vine, a cluster where there's people that are going to lift you up, people at City Center, people in your small groups that are going to encourage you and out help you outlast the things that are trying to overwhelm you and outshine you and all these other things. God says, listen, you got the wrong viewpoint. You just see yourself like this. You need to see yourself connected to a body of believers who are backed by a big God. It's the valley of the cluster. That's what the enemy is scared of. He's scared of some grasshoppers getting together that says, I might be small by myself, but we are grasshoppers. And listen, we pop up together. We can overtake the land that we step on. So how do you see yourself today? Do you see yourself like this? Do you see yourself like this? Just one little grape, like one little grasshopper. Or, you know, and, and, and just let you know, you can't buy one grape at, at the store. I've tried. <laughs> try, I mean, tried this morning. Ma'am, uh, sir, you can't be still. Oh, sorry about that. I want to go back to the jail before I preach. We'll wait till afterwards. Anyway, uh, you, 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 you can't just buy one grape. Why? Because one grape doesn't have enough weight for them to measure how much it costs. You may get that later on. Some of you, been, some of you your faith's too small. You've been believing God for one grape. God wants you to believe for a cluster. You, so, you know, some of you need to feel the weight of what it's going to be like to stand for your family, to stand for your destiny, to stand for your job, to stand for your retirement, to stand that no matter what's going on, God's got you. He, you're believing for one great. God wants you to believe for clusters. But he, listen, but when you got a cluster, when you got a community of believers, yeah, you might be a grasshopper, but listen, God wants and is saying that you are stronger together. And some of you have counted yourself out. Some of you have counted yourself as one little grasshopper. Some of you have counted all the giants. Listen, but I want you to know you, are, you can count on God. Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit. They said, in spite of the giants, listen, I'm counting on a God who will make up the difference. We can certainly do it. He didn't say he didn't say himself we that's why if I was enemy I would do everything in my power to disconnect you from community I would do everything in my power to try and rob you and give you excuses to not to go to small groups not show up on Sunday not show up on Wednesday and keep you isolated which is what he's done an amazing job the last four years and you know what and we bought it hook line and sinker you need community. You are not powerful enough by yourself to overcome the things in this world. You need people. And God is putting people around your life and you're upset and you're irritated because you know what? You're irritated by you. You're irritated by the fact that you've not shown up and said, you know what? I'm going to lean into Jesus and I'm going to lean into the people he's put in my life. Too many of you have been spending so much time rebuking the people that God's put in your life. And you're like, I don't know why I'm alone because you pushed everybody away. Get healthy, acknowledge your junk, lean into Jesus and start doing community. Find your tribe. And I'm telling you, he'll do whatever, the enemy will do whatever he can to disconnect you from the cluster. And this is the valley of cluster. Our strength is in being together and being connected to the vine. 
And I truly believe that some of you, the giants have made you go back and say, ah, that's not for me. Church is not for me. Groups are not for me. You know, leaving, leaning into Jesus is not for me. Believing in God for big things is not for me. And the day I believe that God wants to infuse you and I with faith and hope to believe, it is for you. But I want to just tell you as we wrap this up, you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to fight for this thing. You don't have to fight for community. You don't have to fight for, for the miracles that you've been believing God for. And I'm glad you're believing God for, but you, want, you have to stay strong in faith and not wavering. You're gonna have to fight. You're gonna have to fight to stay connected. You're gonna have to fight. Listen, he didn't promise there would be an unoccupied land. There's enemies there. He promised that it would be yours. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your presence that is here. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for being so kind and so good. I thank you that in spite of what we're going through, in spite of where, where we're at, and all the things that we're continuing with, you are greater. I thank you, Father. It's an it's a odd prayer to pray. And I, I know I didn't grow up praying this, but in recent years, you've changed my view. Thank you for the valleys. Thank you for the trials. Thank you for shaking me out of my boat. Thank you for shaking me out of my comfort zones. Thank you for shaking me out of, out of my own belief. Thank you for shaking me out of my habits and my outlooks that have been paralyzing and penalizing to my faith and to my walk and to my family and the people that are around me. I think, God, that you're doing a deep, deep work that deep is crying out the deep that, Father, we're learning to live a life, especially at City Center Church. God, we're, we're not afraid to be uncomfortable. We're not afraid of sacrifice. We're not afraid to take a, take, take a lunch or a supper or a breakfast and say, I'm not going to eat. I'm going to pray. We're not afraid of pursuing you. We're not afraid of, of walking the line. We're not afraid of, of standing up for holiness. We're not afraid of leaning into you. We're not afraid of speaking to demonic spirits and commanding them to go in Jesus' name, no matter where we're at. But Holy Spirit, would you show us what, what's our takeaway today? And for most of us, it's gonna be different. What is our takeaway from today's message? Would you speak that to us? Would you show us? Whether right now or just throughout the course of the week. I think if we're challenging us and, and, and as a result of the challenge, you're changing us that we're going from glory to glory. If you're here this morning, you say, Matt, I don't know Jesus. He's not my Lord and Savior. I'm not living for him. Would you pray for me? Would you mind just shoot up your hand long enough for me to pray for you, recognize you? Matt, I'm not where I should be. God bless you. Who else? I'm proud of you. Who else? Thank you right here in the middle. Thank you, my friend. Who else? In the back. God bless you. Who else? Awesome. Anybody else? I'm going to pray for you here in a little bit. But I want to tell you one thing. Yeah, you and I don't know if I'm, we've maybe done the best job, but I'm asking God to give us a, 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 a better game plan for those that find Jesus. And I'm not blaming anyone, but at the end of the day, you can blame me. I want you to know this isn't just about lifting up your hand and saying a prayer. This is about saying, I'm going to trade in my old life for a new life. I'm going to get a Bible. I'm going to call on Jesus. I'm going to get connected to a church. I'm going to get connected to a small group. I'm going to tell you, the work starts when you make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Whether you come here or don't, we would love to connect you with a church or connect you here at this church. But it's going to, listen, it's going to require some work. Again, vertically, the work is done horizontally. The work is just starting for many of you. It takes effort, it takes work to trust Jesus. It takes faith to love Jesus, to love people, to go to church, to get up and say no to the flesh. Uh, you know what, I'm, 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 I'm not gonna live in, in my comfort zone. I'm gonna go to a small group, I'm gonna disciple, I'm gonna get out, I'm gonna get out of the way and, and let Jesus use me in, in public. That, that, that's a big step. I want you to know, this is a big deal that, you, that, that, you're, that you're taking up and saying, I'm gonna pursue Jesus. So pray this prayer with me. Say, dear Heavenly Father, I believe you sent Jesus to die in my place. I confess to you my sin and I receive your forgiveness. Show me what my next steps are. I thank you for the courage and faith to live boldly for you. Fill me with your spirit and give me wisdom for the days ahead in Jesus' name. I'm gonna ask you one more question. We're just going to be a little public here. You just keep your eyes open. I, I really hope you'll be honest because this would be a good step for many of you. Some of you are like, you've been a, you've been a believer for a long, long time. You know what? Maybe it's time to kind of fess up and confess and say, you know, I need some help. How many of you would say, boy, Matt, I tell you, this, uh, this message hit me right between the eyes. Um, um, I've, lost my, I've lost my fight. 
I'm, I'm, I'm so perplexed. I'm so overwhelmed by the giants that are around me. I, I've forgotten how big the grapes could be. I've forgotten how, abundance, how, abundantly much, how, how, how abundantly God wants to bless me and my family. I've become so overwhelmed by the things I see. I've stopped putting all my faith in God. In and honestly, I'm a little road weary. I'm really tired of the season I've been in. But I want to change. I want to change my perspective. I want to change my view. You say, Matt, would you pray for me? Just shoot your hand up. Come on. How many? Shoot it up. Look, you're not alone. You're not alone. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. I want you to put your hands up. Father, right now, I speak life over every individual. I speak to every unclean spirit and every spirit of hell that is attempting to rob them and torment them of the position they already have in you and the perspective they're to have through you. In the name of Jesus, I command the spirit of tiredness and fatigue to cease. I command the spirit of depression and oppression, suicide to leave in the name of Jesus. You spirit of anxiety, you spirit of worry, you spirit of hurry that tries to rush us through what God has slowly taken us through, I bind you up and I command you to leave right now in the name of Jesus. I bind every spirit connected to schizophrenia, hearing voices, I command you out right now in the name of Jesus. Leave these people. And Father, I ask you to come in. Holy Spirit, we invite you in to come in to fill to overflow in every place that's been vacated. I think if we're a sound mind, I think if we're a strong heart, I think if we're healthy bodies, I think if we're a renewed perspective, I think if Father, for a renewed outlook in and through you, in Jesus' name. Thank you for the opportunity to shine for you and to live big for you in Jesus' mighty name. You guys are amazing. Go live for Jesus. Love you. Bye-bye.